March 16, 2014, a referendum was held in Crimea. According to the statements of the Crimean authorities, more than 96% of voters put a check mark to the first question in the bulletin, which read, Are you in favor of the reunification of Crimea with Russia as a subject of the Russian Federation? On March 17, Ukraine announced their first limited military mobilization. First of all, the military needed men who had recently served in the army or volunteers. Back then, no one knew how long this would last. No one could have guessed what problems the army would have to face and what a hybrid war was. This is the second film of the History of the War series. We're trying to get to the bottom of such events as the annexation of Crimea and the ensuing anti-terrorist operation in the east of Ukraine. What does the Russian Federation have to do with all this? And how does the confrontation between Ukraine and Russia pose a potential threat to Europe overall? The very next day after the referendum, Russian President Vladimir Putin signed a decree recognizing the Republic of Crimea as an independent state. Immediately after that, the Crimean authorities appealed to the government of the Russian Federation with a proposal to admit the Republic of Crimea to Russia. On March 18, 2014, the corresponding articles of the decree were assigned. Usually, the bureaucratic machinery of a state is very bulky and clumsy, and from the moment of making any decision, it can take years to implement it. In the case of the annexation of Crimea, Russia worked extremely quickly. Given the speed of decision-making, it is fair to assume that these steps were orchestrated well ahead of time. Preparations for annexation had been carried out, legal and regulatory documents had been drafted and issues of management and interaction with the new territorial unit were resolved. This is a classic scenario of a hybrid war when cellular, mobile communications are being monitored, extensive propaganda is being conducted through the Russian mass media and unwelcome Ukrainian TV channels are being shut down. The troops of the Russian Federation were put in full combat readiness. They were instructed to respond to any actions on the part of Ukraine. Under the guise of military training exercises, about 20,000 Russian troops with artillery, armored vehicles and air defense weapons were mobilized and concentrated on the northeastern border of Ukraine. On March 18, 2014, the first casualties in the Russian-Ukrainian hybrid war were registered. Captain Valentin Fedun was wounded. While on a rooftop, he observed the movements of Russian special forces and the attack against his military unit and reported this information to the headquarters. After a while, he took a strong blow and fell. The first bullet pierced his cheek and exited through his neck. The second bullet hit in the area near his left collarbone exited near his left shoulder blade. In former Soviet republics, special units are trained to use precisely this kind of shooting, the so-called doubles, a series of two single shots. This allows one to shoot at a high rate, sufficient precision and low consumption of ammunition. This is the signature of professional snipers. Similarly, two bullets from an army 5.45 cartridge killed warrant officer Serhii Kokurin. During the attack on the 13th Photogrammatic Center, he was on the observation tower in the vehicle park of this unit. The forensic medical examination found that the shots were made from below. One of the bullets hit him right in the heart. It is rather cruel irony that the first soldier killed in the Russian war against Ukraine was an ethnic Russian. In 2014, the Army of Ukraine had 50,000 personnel, however only about 6,000 were combat ready. Given the high probability of an invasion of Russian troops from the northeast, in the event of an escalation the Ukrainian government was forced to avoid confrontation. By the day of the official signing of the agreement on the annexation of Crimea by Russia, all communications and the military infrastructure of the peninsula were already controlled by the Russian military forces. On March 19, the headquarters of the naval forces of Ukraine was seized by the invaders. On the same day, being deprived of all their command, the troops of the Coastal Defense Unit of Ukraine surrendered. 
In a strict sense, command is a very important element of the sustained power of the troops. A high percentage of the Crimean military, which took the Russian oath, was partially due to the fact that the communication lines with Kyiv were damaged or seized. The flow of information was blocked and orders did not reach the addresses. The army was blind and deaf. For this reason, the troops who were in complete information isolation could not respond consistently to the enemy's actions. Well, we must honestly say, we have done everything to deprive them of special communications there. Precisely for this purpose, the Special Forces Unit exists. It knows exactly what must be done and how to execute. On March 20, the command ship Donbass, the rescue tug Kremenets and the firefighting boat Borshchev of the Ukrainian Navy, which was stationed at Streletska Buchta in Sevastopol, lowered the Ukrainian flag and raised the St. Andrews flag of the Russian Navy. The commander of the 5th Brigade of Surface Ships of the Naval Forces of Ukraine, Vitaly Svyahintsev, having defected to Russia, ordered all ships to dock on the coast. Five ships of the Naval Forces of Ukraine, Vinnytsia, Konstantin Olshansky, Kirovohrad, Cherkasy, Chernihiv, sailed to the middle of Lake Donuzlov, avoiding capture. Being blocked in the territorial waters, they could not leave. If all the commanders did this, I am sure that Crimea would not have been surrendered. I do not hold up myself as an example, by no means. I tried to do my duty, keeping in mind the situation, keeping in mind the fact that even if there are no orders, it was unnecessary to do what they did. By the evening of the same day, commanders and commanding officers of 72 military units, institutions and ships of the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine stationed on the Crimean Peninsula, including 25 five auxiliary fleet vessels and six warships of the Ukrainian Navy, decided to voluntarily join the ranks of the armed forces of Russia for continued military service. On March 21, the Crimean Federal District of the Russian Federation was established. There's nothing new about such a decision. Even before the Second World War, while preparing an invasion of Europe, the leadership of the USSR addressed similar issues in almost the same way. The state administration bodies were prepared in advance and, following the army, were to take over the function of effective management of the conquered state as soon as possible. On the same day, the minesweeper Cherkasy made the first attempt to break through from Donu's log. Seamen tried to pull off one of the scudded ships with mooring cables, but the minesweeper did not have enough power. The commander of the ship, captain of the third rank, Yuri Fedosh, asked the sailors from the minesweeper Chernihiv for assistance, but to no avail. On the same day, two pro-Russian officers, a midshipman and nine personnel, abandoned the Cherkasy. Three pro-Ukrainian seamen from the Chernihiv minesweeper took their place. By maneuvering, the Cherkasy continued to hold the fort. On March 22, the Ukrainian airbase in Belbek was taken by assault. Initially, the assault was expected around 6 a.m. However, it in fact took place after lunch. At 1300, Colonel Yuli Mamchur received a phone call made by a Russian colonel who demanded a personal meeting. During the negotiations, the commander once again faced an ultimatum. Within an hour, his unit must surrender or the assault will begin. During this hour, more than 50 civilians, so-called representatives of the Don Cossacks and Crimean self-defense, approached the fence of the unit. They were aggressive. From behind the fence, they shouted threats and insults at the Ukrainian military. Then two armored personnel carriers broke through the fence and, covering the groups of special forces, moved forward. The advance of the enemy was accompanied by the shooting of automatic weapons and explosions of flashbang grenades. One Ukrainian soldier was wounded. The enemy special forces quickly took control of the unit. And by the end of the day, the national flag of Ukraine was down. On March 23, the commander of the minesweeper Cherkasy confirmed that he had a communication with the command. Another attempt to bypass two scuttled ships resulted in the Cherkasy bumping into a towing vessel, from which attempts were made to board them. The bow of the minesweeper ran aground after colliding with one of the boats. On March 24, Russian troops made a rush at the naval base in Feodosia. After tying the hands of the local Ukrainian marines, they carted them off. Acting President of Ukraine Alexander Tuchinov announced that the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine had been instructed to withdraw its military units from Crimea. Taking into account the impossibility of adequate resistance to the invasion, 
The agreements were made by Ukrainian government with the Russian side on the withdrawal of servicemen who do not wish to continue serving under the banner of the Russian Federation to the territory of mainland Ukraine. On the night of March 25, the minesweeper Cherkasy fell under control of the Russian Navy after a long assault. This was the last military asset in Crimea under the Ukrainian flag. After the failure of the steering machine, the ship became uncontrollable. The Russian military seized the obstinate vessel. The crew deserted the ship the next day, leaving from mainland Ukraine. The last to leave the ship was Commander Yuri Fedosh. But meanwhile, as long as we resisted, we were buying time. I knew that we were buying time. I had a fixed communication with Kiev, and I knew that as long as the ship was under the Ukrainian flag, it immobilized Russia on the mainland. And we were buying time as long as we could. And later it turned out that we could not maneuver. Firstly, the ship was from an outdated fleet. Secondly, the lake itself is narrow, and it was necessary to constantly change the ship's course. This led to the main control post breaking down first, and then the emergency post broke down. And when we lost the ability to maneuver, the Russians took advantage of this and began the assault. At that time, we were already alone. We could certainly destroy those special forces that had stormed us, but they would have also destroyed us. It was decided to go to the mainland of Ukraine in order to regroup and continue the battle. On March 28, a decree was issued on the withdrawal of Ukrainian troops from Crimea and Sevastopol. The control over the implementation of this decree was entrusted to Secretary of the National Security and Defense Council Andriy Parubi. On the same day, Parubi said that he had already ordered the construction of military towns on mainland Ukraine to accommodate servicemen arriving from Crimea. All this time, the special services of the Russian Federation were agitating Ukrainian servicemen seeking to entice qualified specialists to serve in the Russian Army and Navy. Before the beginning of the aggression of the Russian Federation, the total number of Ukrainian servicemen stationed in the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol was about 20,000. About 6,000 of them decided to continue their service in the armed forces of Ukraine. It was for this reason that they left Crimea. With them, from the territory of the peninsula, they took away their families and things they could carry. They had to leave their apartments, land and other real estate behind. All the servicemen who violated the oath and who defected to the side of the Russian troops were declared traitors of the homeland. However, for several months, the military from Crimea had the right to enter the mainland without any sanctions. But information about this chance was in every possible way blocked by the special services of the Russian Federation, and not all knew about this concession. The Russian annexation of the Crimean Peninsula succeeded in the first place thanks to carefully thought-out propaganda and the high performance of its special services. The armed forces were used rather for demonstration of force than for the actual intended purpose. The soldiers of the Russian Federation were specially instructed. For being deliberately suave to the civilians, they received the nickname Polite People. On April 2, Putin signed a decree on the inclusion of Crimea in the Southern Military District. The assimilation of the peninsula was initiated, the main task of which is to erase everything that was Ukrainian.